live from Torbay Hospital. It's a bit wet and wild here today. I'm Amanda Gunning and I'm co-presenting the show today with Nick Knapper. We've got a really exciting show for you today. Uh, Joe, who's very much normally behind the scenes at the show, has actually been undergoing a virtual reality challenge to cure her fear of spiders. So if, like me, you're a little bit frightened of the little crawly things, you might want to stay tuned to see how that goes. If you didn't make it to Learning Technologies this year, we've got an update from the show and we managed to grab some of the presenters and get a little bit of a feel for what they were talking about. Phil Redford down in Dorset has been using an augmented reality app, so we're going to find out a bit about that and I think that's got loads of potential for the NHS and for training and communication in general, so do stay tuned for that one. And back by popular demand, is Paul Wilder's gadget show and you might have noticed there's an ambulance behind me. Now this is not just any old ambulance, oh no, this is a simulance or a simulated ambulance and we're going to be taking a peek inside a bit later on. So hopefully Nick is now back from the beach, he's dried off and he's again live in the studio so over to you Nick. It's great to be back for Tell Friday 2019 and have we got a show for you today as well as the items that Amanda told you about in the uh, intro just there, we've got the software show, which is new for this year. We've got Nick Perez talking about developments in virtual reality. We've got the results of an e-learning research study, which was carried out in 2018. We've got Laodil's self-teach re uh, resuscitation quality improvement initiative. And we've got a cognitive challenge for you, but I'll, more of that in a minute. We've also got Richard Bryce, Richard Grice correction, uh, coming to us from uh, Yorkshire Ambulance Service. And the cognitive challenge we've got for you guys this year is we're going to hide some comments which are cultural references from famous movies in the script. So if you'd like to join this competition, you have to ask yourself one question. Are you feeling lucky? And if you are, then send in your, uh, the comments that you think you've noticed to the address which is coming up on the screen just now. So you can uh, tweet or you can telephone or you can send them in uh, via YouTube comments. We've also got our famous challenge which is live as always this year. And what we're doing this year is we're actually going to see is e-learning better than face-to-face -face training when we choose exactly the same subject. And we're going to go back to Amanda now who's going to introduce the live challenge. Thanks Nick, I'm here with the Learning Challenge team. Today's challenge is all about face-to-face -face training versus e-learning. So let's meet the teams. So we've got Will and Andy, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, Will. Morning, so I'm Will, I'm from Taunton and Somerset Foundation Trust. Andy, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Andy. Yeah, Andy and I'm from here in Torbay. So Andy, what exactly is the challenge today? Okay, so today we're going to be putting uh, e-learning up against face-to-face -face training and we're going to be using the um, how to tie a sling. So there'll be training via e-learning and training via face-to-face. -face. I'll be doing the e-learning and we'll be doing the face-to-face. -face. Fantastic. And Will, why are we doing this particular challenge? So I'm really interested to find out what is more effective. So to teach someone how to put a sling on, is e-learning the best medium or is face-to-face -face training the best medium? So Will, do you reckon you're going to find that out today? I want the answers. I want the truth. Well, you can't handle the truth. Oh, my word. Things are hotting up in the uh, challenge today already. So I think it's time to meet the rest of the team. So we have some lovely volunteers here. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. So you are? Hello, everybody. My name's Kerry and I work at Torbay Hospital at the Horizon Centre. Thank you, Kelly. Andy, working here at Digital Horizons. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. I'm Lois Chris, I work as an e-learning simulation technician for Cornwall Foundation Partnership Trust. Brilliant, thank you Chris. I'm Pip. Hiya, I'm Pip. I work for the NHS in Somerset in the Technology Enhanced Learning Team. Brilliant, great. Thank you very much. Welcome to you all. So I think that what we need to do now is actually work out who's going to be on which team. So I've got some cards here and they say either e-learning or face-to-face. -face. So I'd like you all to pick a card and find out which team you're going to be in. But first of all, have any of you got any preferences as to what you'd like to be in? Oh, I think I'll go e-learning. Same, I'd like to go e-learning. Not bothered. I'm not bothered either. Okay, so let's see what you get then. So if you wouldn't mind picking a card and then revealing it to the camera. I have e-learning. Okay. Face to face. E-learning. 
And that leaves face to face. Okay. So if you'd like to join your respective team leaders, so we have e-learning over here and face to face over here, and we can start the challenge. So you've got about an hour, I think, and 20 minutes to start this. So good luck, everyone. Time starts now. Back to Nick in the studio. Thanks, Amanda. We now move on to the my, what's really my favorite bit of the show. Are any of you out there spider phobic? And if you are, can you imagine actually having a real life tarantula on your hand? Well, that's the experiment we're going to look at now. One of our production team, Joe, seriously spider phobic, volunteered to take part using an app and virtual reality to cure her of spider phobia with the aim that she could have a real life tarantula on her hand. And we're going to go to a video clip now that shows the beginning of this process. Could she do it? Hello, my name's Joanne and I have a fear of spiders. So I've been tasked to try and overcome my fear of spiders through using a virtual reality app called Fearless. This is my first session. It's taken me a while to actually think about putting this headset on. Um, so I'm planning also on keeping a short video diary of how I get on. <laughs> okay, go for it, just, just breathe. Okay, that was my first session over with and wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Okay, so in the virtual environment, I'm sat at a virtual table in a virtual room. So I've decided to make it a little bit more realistic and sit at my table. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Yes, the Yeah, I, I felt my my heart rate go up and a bit of panic set in when it got close to the edge of the virtual table. So I think I need to start doing some calming breaths and um, get some chocolate before I move on. I haven't yet got out of moving away from my physical table when it gets a little bit close to the edge of the virtual table but I've managed to keep the headset on and um, some deep breathing has um, helped. I've decided I'm ready to go to the next level otherwise I'll stay forever just watching a small spider. The next level is uh, a medium sized spider so I'm going to go in and see what they mean by a medium sized spider. So see you in a little while. That is big. That is big. Okay, so that medium-sized spider was a big spider and it was coming straight towards me. So, um, yeah, I, I need a while on this level. Interesting stuff there. And you can see the impact of that virtual reality on Joe there as she genuinely backed away in that room. Is she going to make it? Is she going to overcome this phobia? Join us a bit later. We'll see how she gets on. Next, we're going to go to some clips from Learning Technologies this spring. I'm sure a lot of you already know, every January or February, Learning Technologies runs one of the best um, technology-enhanced learning conferences in the country. We go there each year, and the team have visited different lectures and spoken to different people. We've got a couple of interviews coming up now, and a couple more later in the program. First, we're going to go to Ben Betts and then Richard Price. What sort of things are you working on? Do you have any exciting projects on the go? We've always got exciting projects on the go. But so, HD2 Labs at the moment, one of the things we're working on is it's this idea of, of kind of smart nudges. How can we get people to behave or try something different based on data? So we've had this product Learning Locker for quite a while, and what that does, it collects data on all of the different learning experiences people do. That's great for analysis and reporting, but you're just kind of doing it post hoc, 
like you know what happened and you can see whether it worked or not. What if we actually want to change it before it's got to the output? So we're using data with a, a new app that we call Sparks. The idea of Spark is to spark a change, spark something different. So based on data, if we can see that you're doing really well, how can we get you to go further? And if you're falling behind or not quite on the right path, how can we nudge you back into performance? And that might be through an email or through a note to your line manager or to a nudge of some revision or some further content. So this idea of using data proactively to really help people improve in the learning performance as opposed to just looking at a report at the end of it and going like, well, a lot of people failed, really, really wish that was different. So we're trying to get into that in the middle and nudge people into better action. I'm here at Learning Technologies with Rachel Price from Health Education England um, and I just wanted to catch up with you mentioned about what you're working on at the moment and exciting projects. So I think you wanted to talk a little bit about your AI project. Yeah, so artificial intelligence is such a buzzword at the moment that everybody's talking about it. Um, and we decided we wanted to actually do something about it and do some personalised learning and see what we could do. We're working with these guys at Filtered um, to produce a personalised learning tool around digital capabilities. So we take a uh, set of resources, people work through a chatbot, they then get presented with a set of resources, a little bit like shelves in Netflix, um, that gives them personalised information about their learning needs around digital. So you answer a set of questions and then it makes some recommendations about the areas that it thinks you've got weaknesses in. So say you've got a problem with digital communication, you might uh, need to do some learning around how to deliver a webinar or something like that. So that would be personal to you. So if you and I did the, the chat block and work through this, we'd get different results. So in terms of being AI, how does it learn from the responses that people give to it? So every time you click on one of the links or every time you access the resource, um, it's collecting data around that, anonymized data. And it's taking that and it's working out against its sort of sample data set that we've, we've curated. Um, and it's learning and it's getting better. So it's using what's called machine learning to actually do that, 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 that rich analysis of the data that then makes it perfect. to the learning challenge and a special hello to everyone who's been commenting on YouTube and saying hello to us here Bristol and Dorset have been commenting so thank you very much. Right so I'm back with the guys we're with the e-learning team. How have things been going? Yeah not too bad we're up and running now we had a few hiccups believe it or not before we started so only uh, half the team was up and running within the first minute that <laughs> sort of a few login problems but we quickly ironed those out and now yeah we're both up and running well, both the trainers are up and running. So uh, I can see that they're both doing the e-learning at the moment. Um, how long does the e-learning actually take to complete? It's not long. I mean, uh, tying a sling only takes a few, you know, five, well, about a minute, the actual video regarding the sling. But we put a bit of theory in there as well about which sling you should apply. So we kind of blended the, um, yeah, the theory along with the practical all into one package to make more assessment criteria come the end of uh, Tell Friday. And did you purchase this e-learning or did you create this one yourself? No, it was, it was made in-house. I, I, I created this. Yeah. Especially for the show? Especially for the show, yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant, okay. So uh, your role in this really is, is e-learning support, isn't it? You're just sort of here in the background to help these guys, so you uh, can't... Absolutely, and I cannot speak to them. I mean, they're literally, this is their first run through, so they haven't had any um, suggested questions, but even if they do, I can't answer. I literally just have to make sure the audio comes through, the pictures are playing, and then I have to step back. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So if you do have any questions for the e-learning team, then please do contact us via the text messaging or via the YouTube chat. Hopefully the details of this will be coming up on the screen shortly. Okay, so I think we should go and see how the face-to-face -face team are getting on. So let's move on through. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, how's it going then? It's going well so far. We've had a look at the two different types of sling. Um, and now we've been just learning about how to do a reef knot, which okay. I think they're going to demonstrate for you now because they've mastered it already. Oh, okay. Let's see your reef knots. Wow, that's looking good. And do we know why a, a reef knot's really important as a as a knot for a sling? Because it comes out easy. Because it comes out easy. Oh, brilliant. Well, okay. It's easy to tie, and it's easy to, tie yeah. and it's easy to take off. 
fantastic. Oh, that's really good. So, so far. next door, been having a few technical problems. You'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> How have things been going in here? How's the training delivery been going? So, well, I guess you'll have to ask my two learners, okay. but I'm feeling pretty happy. You're I'm glad I got these two people. You're feeling quite with. confident today. Yeah. 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 How, how is Will as a trainer? Well, we've had no technical hitches so far. So far, everything's gone according to plan, I think. We've got a lesson plan that we're following, and we have learned how to tie a reef knot. Brilliant. And we're about to start on actually applying the sling. Ooh, okay, stage two. So, Will, how did you make sure that the face-to-face -face training was uh, very similar to the e-learning? Because obviously they need to be pretty similar to be a fair test, yeah. really, doesn't it? So myself and Andy worked together. Andy built the e-learning, obviously. I designed a lesson plan, and then we put them together, and we worked through them together to make sure we were teaching the same information, we were using the same kind of base resources so that it was more of a fair test. Um, so I'm pretty happy that they are pretty consistent. Do you think you're going to win this challenge? I know we're going to win this challenge. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone. I shall leave you to carry on with your face-to-face -face training. We're back over to Nick in the studio. Thanks, Amanda. Welcome back. And welcome to Paul for this year's 2019 Gadget Show. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you. And uh, what, or should I say who, have you brought along? Well, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. So let's start off uh, quite rightly with my guest. So uh, I've named my guest um, Archie Harrison, because <laughs> um, I thought I'd be topical here. Um, and as you see here, the amazing thing about it, this is, this is what I think is really the next generation of simulation mannequins. And the first thing you see immediately is, unlike most of the mannequins that just look like inert, um, kind of they're just sitting there and they could be dead or alive you can immediately tell that Archie here is actually alive and he's busy moving and and I think that's absolutely brilliant and in fact you can notice he's got facial expressions here so he can actually move he's actually got like a bit of robotics in there and I think that's really really cool um, and he's got some other things he can do as well so for example if I said something to Archie um, he'll react to it so if I said something like Archie how do you feel about the fact that Nick could be your father He doesn't seem very happy about that idea, okay. does he? And you can do things like um, pre-record sp uh, speech. So if I did something like, here's a great drawing I did earlier, Archie. What do you think of it? Wow, Paul, that's amazing. <laughs> Except your voice has gone slightly <laughs> high-pitched on that one. <laughs> that's because we filmed that this morning. We just yeah. recorded it this morning. But it's really quick to do. Brilliant. So Brilliant. those are some really great things it can do. Um, something else it can do, if I, if I take a uh, pen torch, obviously, like a lot of mannequins, it's got all those standard high-fidelity features, like it's got interactive eyes and things. But it can track. So if we put this here, if we start on that, I think we'll start on this side. I'll get it close enough. Hopefully, as I move across, Archie should track. There we go. Brilliant. Uh, that's really good, Archie. Well done. I think that's absolutely great. So I'm really excited as a, a simulation technologist about what you can do with these new mannequins. No, that's, I'm really impressed. And I, as you said, I can see this is going to be the future because I'm already looking over there and thinking, I don't remember that night. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you got next for us, Paul? So next, I have to be really careful how I say this because I keep saying it wrong. I have something called the virtual patient Difficult conversation simulator. Okay. Um, and that I went up to Ashford St. Peter's to look okay. at. Okay, and I believe we've got some video clip there to look at that. Hi, so I'm here at St. Peter's and we're going to look at some virtual communication. Virtual patients. Communica okay, virtual patient communication skills, fine. Tell me more about that, because obviously you know much more about this than I do. Uh, well, as you can see, this is our kit. We're being filmed by this camera and projected live into the screen. There's our virtual patient ready to go. Rather than me try and explain it to you, Paul, why don't you have a seat and we'll demo it live. Yeah, it does sound quite complicated, I think it's probably a really good idea. Right, I'm going to sit here then, dear. Yeah. Okay, oh, I can see myself on the screen. Okay, so our virtual patient is going to talk to you and you just need to reply to him. So normally, before we, before we set this up with the junior doctors, I would have given you the whole scenario. Okay. I won't go into that now. Let's just say that this is a guy who's come to visit his grandmother in hospital, and he's found out she's got a do not resuscitate form on her chart, and he's kind of upset about it, and he wants to speak to a member of the team about it. Your task is to communicate with him. So he'll say something to you, and you can reply. Okay. Thank you for seeing me. I've been looking for someone to talk to. This all happened so fast. Okay, can you tell me what happened? 
So, three days ago, I get a phone call from my sister saying that my grandma was brought to hospital. I had no idea that she was in the sick game. Oh, and have you talked to a nurse about this? Yeah. What is my legal standing here? That's a good question. I have no idea what the legal standing is. But that's, that's a really good point to stop on, actually. So, yeah. so that was really realistic, you know, yeah. and I could, I could just drop straight in even though I'm, I'm not a clinician myself. Um, so, what sort of scenarios do you use this with then? So, we use these scenarios to train the foundation year one doctors in their um, clinical role. So, although we're a mental health trust, we're actually using this to support the um, Ashford and St Peter's foundation year one doctors here on the horse. Uh, we've got a whole range of scenarios that relate to really uh, real aspects of the foundation doctor's experience. So how do you actually control then what the, the avatar patient actually says then? So the patients are all pre-filmed according to scripts that we've written, they're written by um, clinicians, so they're very clinically relevant scenarios. And then we get the actors in on, on a separate day and we film them in very tiny segments. And um, using the touch screen we can now sequence together those segments to make a conversation. So um, we know that it's not exactly the same as talking to a real person. We don't expect it to be. You know, when you use a resuscitation doll, you don't expect it to be a real person, but you can use that to get the skills that you need from it. So we use this to kind of encourage those conversations in a safe space and to give us that thinking space. So yeah, we, I'll show you the touch screen. Excellent. Um, and then, yeah, you can go if you like. Yeah, because I mean, you did. You, you said said a second ago that um, you can make the patient act more angry or less angry. Yeah, so I'd be interested right. to see how you actually can do that on your touch. Screen. Yeah, and we can actually make him walk out if he gets really annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Obviously, that's never happened. Let's have a touch screen then. Oh, so this is so this is your control panel then. Yeah, this is our control panel. It's a touch screen. So what it is is there's four rows here, um, and they're they're roughly uh, aligned in terms of. Um, Warm for conversation. So the top row is an engaged patient, oh, yeah. neutral rows are uh, neutral responses. This is more disengaged. And this is prompt responses, which we can use to guide the learner back into the conversation. So it's like a giant matrix then, isn't it, with what they say here along with, with right. their emotional state. Yes, yeah, so the topic index, for example, legal action, you can have a, an engaged response, a neutral response, or a disengaged response. So at the bottom, we've just got some random comments that you can throw in at any point, like OK, yes, no. Are these the ones for if I go completely off topic and say, so I hear you've got a cat? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that would be the prompt questions. Oh, that's all right. Oh, Why are you asking? Then you can oh, see okay. what kind of, it, it should prompt you to come back into the conversation. Do you want to know what the rest of the family think? Oh, right, I see what you mean. So. And then you play one of these. Oh, because that's other family members. My parents passed away several years ago, but I've spoken to my sister, and she agrees that grandma should be resuscitated if she needed it. So that helps you guide the learner back into the conversation. So that's actually really simple for, for a clinician to learn then, to yes. facilitate a, a session. Then, yeah, we've tried to make it as intuitive as possible because we don't really want clinicians to have to have a big onerous burden of things to learn in order to pick this up. But there is still an element, in a way, guesswork, because we don't expect everybody to learn every single response. So we've arranged the matrix as best to guide the, the facilitator. We found that sometimes you do press the wrong button, and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Either you make a joke of it, or you move on, or you just stop and say, well, let's say the patient didn't respond in the way you were expecting. Has that ever happened? And actually, everybody says yes, hmm. and you can do learning from that too. Absolutely. So is the kit portable enough for you to actually take to save my hospital? Actually, it is. Yeah, we have, we have one portable kit, which is basically a laptop and a portable camera and a portable green screen, and another one coming. So yeah, those are portable. Um, they cost about £4,000. There's no licensing agreements or anything. Um, so you could buy one, for example. We would then give you the um, scenarios for free, and then we'd help you learn how to use them. So um, our, our wish is that this would become more widely used because we think it's very, very easy easy to use. And, and as a technologist, I, I have to ask, how easy is it to set up from my point of view as a non-clinician? Well, the laptop um, version is very easy. Obviously, this hard, uh, hardware kind of permanent kit is a bit more complicated. I'm very lucky because I have Craig, who's a very competent technician who works with us, who comes and helps me set this up. But the laptop and portable camera is designed to be used by one person. And once they've been shown how to use it, it, it should run very soon. And how long would it take me to set it up, say? Um, not more than 10 minutes. Really? That, and then I mean, literally I could have a facilitator come in with a load of junior doctors yeah. and they could actually go, be going through these conversations. That's exactly right, that's what we do. And that's a really good use of technology. Thank you very much for Thanks, showing us. Thanks great to show you. <laughs> and don't forget, you can contact us via the numbers that are coming up on your screen there. Any of these methods, any questions, any comments about what you've seen. So, Paul, that yes. was really interesting. 
So you th do the medics accept this? Is it kind of working well? No, I think it works really well. And as a technologist, what, the thing that really excites me is how quickly you can actually set it up. Right. And because it's a whole set of scenarios that are already built in, they're completely replicatable. So you can just use it time and time again. Okay. So within minutes, I can set it up. They can then have a go at it. I'm looking forward really to having it in my hospital. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. OK. So what have you got next for us, Paul? Well, uh, two things for next. Firstly, for the next bit, I'm going to have to ask you to strip. OK. Well. Uh, I'll do anything on uh, Tell Friday. And while you're stripping, Archie, I'm afraid I'm going to have to have the iPad back, so you're going to have to stop playing games on it. Don't touch me. Uh, no, it's OK. <laughs> I just took the iPad. Don't worry. So I'm really excited by this, because this is just like a £20 children's app. Yep. And if we can get the up there. Now, what it's going to try and do is lock onto your T-shirt, hopefully. Uh, if we go a bit closer, is it not? Oh. Because typically, of course, there we go, look at that. So now we can see your organs, and I think that's really good. And as you move... So I'm looking at my own yeah. guts here, basically. And obviously you're not really looking at yours. It's an animated version of it. But I think it's a really enthusiastic way to get kids involved. And you could even use this with things like medical students. And you can do lots of different things on here as well. So we can actually we can switch to different modes, um, and, and we can do... It's all sorts of different little little things that we can actually do with here. Oh, so I've lost, oh, right there. Okay, there we go. I've got the lock back on it again. That's, oh no. Glad to see my heart is still beating. No, <laughs> that's useful to know, yeah. <laughs> and there's, we can look at respiratory, circulatory, digestive system. So it's really, really nice little app. And I think this is really the kind of, um, the future of, of AR. Yeah. AR, really cheap, augmented reality. Yeah. Gets people excited. And like I say, yeah. even though it's, this is designed for children, you can easily use it with medical students. And you've got a nice uh, analogy, haven't you, Paul? For people who are thinking, hang on a second, what's the difference between oh, augmented... Oh, you're talking my sci-fi analogy. Yeah, augmented reality and virtual reality. For people who are not sure, how can you kind of... Right, so virtual, I think virtual reality is like the matrix. That yeah. You're completely immersed in a, in a, in yeah, a virtual yeah. environment. Yeah. Whereas AR... I think it's a bit dated now, but AI is kind of, you think of the Terminator. So yeah. when he looks around, he's got all that coding down the side and he's got extra information. Okay, so but that's AI like the Terminator now, looking at me you then. Know, Terminator was like last century, literally as a film, yeah. and yet we've now got real AI. This yeah. is real AI. It's yeah. great. Absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Okie doke. So what have we got next, Paul? So next, um, we've got um, a, this device here, but of course we've got to plug it in to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I've got one of these back at my hospital. And this is called? Well, this particular one is branded by WePresent, but obviously right. there, are other, there are other companies that do it as well. Yes, yeah. Um, but uh, I've done this back at my hospital. Yeah, okay. doke oh, I believe we've got a video clip which is showing that coming up now. So, here we are in the conference room in the Postgraduate Education Centre at Frimley Park Hospital where I work. And I'm going to talk to you about a problem that a lot of presenters have that come to these sort of rooms. I have a laptop here, right? I come into this room with it, I want to be able to present what's on my screen so that everyone in the room can see it. How do we normally do that in these sort of rooms? Well, you have leads that are attached physically that you have to plug in, HDMI lead and VGA, which are the two most common ones. Our centre has to have a whole box of connectors because we don't know what you're going to bring in. It might be an iPad, it might be an iPhone, it might be a Mac. A whole different range of Macs have different connectors, so we need all these different devices. But this room has a new device in it that, in theory, should get rid of all of these. How does it work? Well, up on the screen there, you can see a whole set of instructions. And those instructions are connecting to a device in the cabinet that you can see here. So the instructions tell me to connect to a local web page once I've connected to the Trust Wi-Fi. So I'm already on the Trust Wi-Fi. I go to this local page, which is https colon slash slash we present to. Okay, and here we are on that page. And on this page, it's asking me to download a little application called Mirror Op Function. And I have to run that. And then it has that security scan. You'll see how quickly this takes. Obviously, this assumes that you're able to install programs onto your laptop. And I know some people have locked down laptops. And in fact, some people have locked down Wi Fi's as well. Um, accept the terms and conditions. And we'll just wait a second or two while it installs. And in actual fact, the one we've got in this particular room, in theory, has a kind of bridge to allow you to connect to whether you're on a guest Wi-Fi or whether you're on the trust Wi-Fi, because we don't allow outsiders to connect to our trust Wi-Fi normally, for obvious reasons. And now we can launch the program. So we launch the program, and it wants to know where the receiver is. And on my screen, I can see that I have an IP address, which is the receiver. So I can put those details in. 
which is just in this case an IP address. And bear in mind, I'm connected onto the same Wi-Fi as that, so it should find us. And it wants to it's a code. It's saying enter the code displayed on FPH PGEC conference room. And at the top right corner, I have a code I can enter. In goes the code. And now fingers crossed, if I minimize that web page, it should connect to that. And now I should be able to click play. And hopefully it will show on the screen. Isn't that brilliant? And now back to me in the studio. That was really interesting, Paul. I quite like that. I quite fancy one of those. But I, before I go out and buy one, I understand you've got a more sophisticated version. Ah, you spotted what's on the table. So I'm going to give this back to Archie. Archie, you can play with this now. Steady your iPad. There you go. Right. Who so, are you? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Who but, are you? Yeah. Right. I'll talk to you later. Um, OK, so this one, double the price, double the size. OK. But pretty much double the functionality as well. So as you saw on that video when I was back at, um, back at my trust, it's a little bit fiddly to use. Yeah. This one is much, much easier to use, and I think that's what's really important. Um, so for example, it's got these USB dongles. Yeah. You get a couple of these. And if you plug that into your laptop, it will automatically run and run an executable, and apparently it will even let you run that executable even if you've got admin privileges locked down. Oh, which is important, um, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of yeah. Us, yeah. So, and then that will automatically hook into this, yeah. right? It's got Apple AirPlay built into it. So right. if you've got an iPhone, you can just hook straight onto it. So much, much simpler to use. And there's some other interesting functionality that these, that these new ones do as well. So you can put these into multiple rooms and have one image gone to multiple rooms if you like, had such a big conference that you're doing them in. And you can have um, multiple presenters. So right. basically, you could have a, like six different presenters all lined up, and then you could switch between them fairly rapidly onto that one screen. And if you had something like 30 candidates all watching it, they've got this thing called web, uh, web slides, I think it's called. Yeah. So effectively, rather than all of them looking at the big screen, they can just look at their own laptop, and their screen is taken over by this device pushing it onto all Excellent. of their screens. So they're the just screen. looking at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, as a technologist, kind of, I feel that my job is to try and simplify things and make things easy yeah. to use for technology. Absolutely. And that one, I think, is a lot, lot better than the other one I showed you on the, on the video. Yeah, so it's kind of twice the price, but it actually does more than twice as much, or more than twice as helpful, perhaps. Yeah, I think yeah. so, more than twice yeah. as helpful. Yeah. And people aren't going to use the other one. If something's fiddly, they're just going to stop using it. They'll yeah. just go back to using the leads, because yes. it's just easier, it's robust. Yeah, yeah. New one, much easier to use. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that, Paul. So, I believe you've got something else for us. What's next? Well, my last thing I've left to last, the biggest thing ever. Okay. So big we couldn't fit it into the studio. <laughs> yep. And it's actually kind of three things in one. Right. But before I can show you the third, we've got to look at the first two. Yeah, OK, so we've got a video which is going to show us exactly what that is. Well, I've got to come up the back here, have I? Yeah, just mind the step there. Well done. Okay, um, so this is the back of the simulants. It's set out as best like a normal ambulance as we can make it. Um, and we would get our staff into the back here and run different scenarios um, for them. Um, here's the place for them to learn um, rather than out on the road on real patients. So it's a safe learning environment for them. That sounds good. Uh, this is our mannequin, Alice, that we've got here today. Um, she appears to have bumped her head a little bit. And um, we've attached this to some monitoring, so it's got an oxygen probe on just down there on her finger and blood pressure cuff, um, which is attached to a 3D DCG. Um, and then this monitoring comes through to here, um, and our staff can have a little look at this. And then what we would do is we would be in the control room, which is just behind us, I'll show you in a moment, and we can change our patient observations so we can make her better or worse, um, depending on how she's treated by our staff. Sounds great. Should we go and have a good control room then? Yeah, let's go. So is this the control room then? Uh, yeah, this is the okay. control room here. Uh, so the idea is that we would have the rest of the team, perhaps if we do team training, um, in the back here so they can see what's going on as well. Um, and then we'd have an educator and a simulation technician um, in this part actually running the simulation. You can see into the back um, from the cameras that Alice is there um, on the stretcher and we can change her observations, as I said earlier, um, by perhaps you know, moving her heart rate up, um, her oxygen levels down, and then we can push that through and that will appear to the crew um, on the monitor in there. Um, we can also put through patient voices. Um, if we wanted Alice to talk, we can, we can do that from here. Um, and as I said earlier, it's just to try and make it as lifelike as possible. So they're fully immersed in the back of the um, ambulance and then we're actually here viewing what's going on. 
Um, at the end of the scenario, we would um, end it, we'd get the crew back round um, and we'd all come and sit in here um, and have a debrief on what's happened, the good points, the bad points, um, things that they might want to improve upon um, in their practice. That sounds great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Oh, this one seems a lot tighter than uh, than the other one I was just in. Yeah, well, they say this one's been built like a real ambulance, so we we obviously haven't got enough space, so we try to make it more realistic. So when you're actually in here, you actually feel, and you get the full aspect of what it would be like working on a vehicle on an ambulance. And I notice your mannequin doesn't um, doesn't look as realistic as Alice did in the uh, in the. Um, no, panel. the mannequin we use on this one is um, we more more of an assessment mannequin. So this one's got more, it's more of a computer based one, so it does a lot more, so you can take a pulse, it breathes for itself, so you can count a spiritual rate, you can practice interventions on him, so our paramedics can practice their cannulation, their intubation skills, they can even do a respiratory assessment and actually listen to the lungs. So it gives you a more, um, more assessment based tool, whereas the other mannequins that can be used are more realistic, so it gives you that sort of human factors, you know that. Um, wow factor like oh wow actually that is a patient mm. and talking of realism um, it does seem really realistic in here so what actually is the difference between this and, and one of your real ambulances uh, there's not much difference the only main difference is obviously with um we are fitted with cameras so we can actually record the training session so we've got a camera above the back door and a camera just above the oh, this one here that one there yeah looks like a microphone but it's actually a camera right um so we can then obviously assess their skills on and see what's going on. So if this is like a real ambulance, then how do you, where do you control the mannequin from? Well, we actually control it from in the front, from one of the passenger seats, and we've got it set up like a mini control room. So if you want to come have a look at that, oh, we okay. can show you that one, see how the difference is there. We'll go out the side door. So Mark, we're now around the front of the vehicle, and to me, it just looks like a real ambulance here. And you'll be right, Paul, it is the front of the vehicle. Um, you're in the driver's seat. And obviously this side is where our technician would be in the passenger side to run the scenario. Um, as you can see, we've got a computer in front of us there. It's got the cameras. So you've got a live feed into the back of the vehicle. So you can actually see what the camera's doing at the time. And we've also got other little tablets that we can use to control the mannequin and various other uh, objects, equipment in the back. Um, so we can actually have a live simulation on the move. So when you're saying on the move, are you really saying that you would be sitting here driving this ambulance down the road, the technician here or the facilitator would be controlling and watching what's going on in the back and the candidates would actually be in the back dealing with their patient? You're absolutely right Paul, yeah that's the whole idea. The idea that we can take our candidates, our students out on the main road, dealing with a live casualty so to speak, in a, in a safe environment and then get the full experience of what it would be like to actually treat a patient in a moving vehicle. I can imagine that would be really, really immersive. Thank you very much for showing us your trust's simulants. No worries. Thank you very much. So you saw me on the video there in two different simulances, and now I'm in a third simulance outside the studio. And with me is Wayne. So, hi Wayne. Hi Paul. And uh, what do you do and what trust do you go to? <laughs> uh, so I'm the simulation education lead for Southwestern Ambulance Service. And you're in charge of the simulants, I presume? Yeah, the simulants along with uh, six other simulation seats that we have dotted across the trust area. Wow, that's, that's quite a lot of kit. So at the start of the programme, we saw Amanda when it was raining outside. What have you got on the outside of the simulants that's a little bit different from the two that I looked at previously? So with this vehicle, we have the abilities to create an outside classroom where we have an outside TV and we have static cameras fixed into the vehicle here and we can broadcast or live stream what is going on inside, outside. Oh, that's really different. That's quite useful. And does that mean if you've got cameras outside, you can actually do simulations outside the vehicle as well as inside the vehicle? Yeah, that's right. We have the static cameras in here, but we also have a portable camera system that we can use anywhere. So not just outside the simulants, we can use it in a classroom or in an office, and then we can live stream that back to the vehicle. Oh, that sounds really, really useful. And there's something bleeping behind us. So can you talk me through what kit we've got on the wall here? Yeah, sure. Obviously, this is slightly different to our regular frontline uh, DCAs, our double crewed ambulances. Given this is a training vehicle, we have an extra monitor uh, which controls our, our, mannequin, uh, and our mannequin. That's this one here. Yeah. That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and our mannequin here is Johnny, uh, our high fidelity mannequin. 
Um, and then we have our electronic uh, care record. So we're paperless within SWAST, within Southwest Ambulance Service. So this device you would find on all our frontline vehicles, and that is our patient care record along as with our, our observations. So you actually, you could put fake data up on there that they can actually use just like if it was a real ambulance? Yeah, so for training purposes, we can create a um, simulated patient. Oh, no, that's really exciting. And, and that's obviously just the virtual patient monitor. So that's just the one running, running this mannequin. And what sort of functionality does this particular mannequin have? So this is a high fidelity mannequin. So we can replicate pretty much any medical emergency that we could find in a, in a human, basically. Brilliant. And I'm, his stretcher looks really interesting. It looks very expensive as well. What can you tell me about this stretcher? <laughs> Uh, so the stretcher is quite unique. Uh, we were one of the first ambulance trusts in the UK to have a power load system. So this vehicle doesn't have a ramp or a tail lift. We have, uh, as I say, a power load, which is a, a relatively new system to the UK. Um, and we've seen the value having it on the training vehicle that we've now invested money. Uh, and our new 63 Fiat ambulances that we have in Cornwall now have this stretcher fitted to it. Oh, so basically they can practice using this stretcher on this one before they actually use it on, on real ambulances. Yeah, that's correct. And it also has huge benefits as well because there's, uh, there's a lot more ease of loading and unloading the patient. That's better for our staff. So we have less muscle skeletal injuries uh, as well as more comfort for the patient. That's absolutely brilliant. So if you've got any other questions for Wayne or any of the other gadgets, then you know where to uh, find it. You can text us. Um, you can put comments on YouTube. And um, I, think, uh, I think Amanda was definitely very happy that you had an awning there when it was raining so much earlier. So uh, from Wayne and me, it's uh, back to Nick in the studio. Great. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Real nice bit of uh, live footage from outside the building. We're actually in at this moment. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to Richard Grice of uh, Yorkshire Ambulance Service, who's put together a fantastic video on how he uses virtual reality to teach ambulance crews in Yorkshire. Hi, my name's Richard and I work for the Yorkshire Ambulance Service. I've put this video together to show you my journey into how I'm developing virtual reality. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about a few things. My camera selection, the stitching process, using Scenario VR for the very first time, and using the scenario in our own LMS. I'm then going to talk about the lessons I've learned from creating my first scenario and what I've decided to do differently. And then finally, I'll be showing you my second scenario. So let's begin. In order to create our simulation, we need four things. A 360 camera, Stitching software, which will enable us to stitch images and videos together so we can view them in 360. VR development software that allows us to add interactive elements to the 360 environment. In this case, we'll be using Scenario VR. And a delivery platform. This can range from a laptop to a VR headset. One of the first things I did is I started to do research into 360 cameras. I then acquired two cameras. So the first camera was a Samsung Gear 360 2016 model. And the second camera was a Samsung Gear 360 2017 model. So what I wanted to do was to see which camera would work best for me. I took both cameras out and took several images and videos. What I found was that the older camera, the 2016 model, gave me better images than the newer model, the 2017 version. However, when it came to video, the 2017 model was a lot better. Now, because primarily I was going to be just using images, I decided to stick with the, the older model, the 2016 version. Now that I decided what camera to use, it was time to see how the stitching process worked. I downloaded the Gear 360 Action Director and added some images and videos to be stitched together. I found that the software worked great, however, the only problem was some images didn't stitch well and this was due to the location of the camera when taking the shot. I found the best workaround for this was to take the shot again but move the camera ever so slightly from the previous location. This solved the issue and was quick and easy to do rather than using Photoshop or After Effects. So now it was time to start using Scenario VR for the very first time. What I decided to do was create a local induction for our training centre in Wakefield. 
I had a look online for some tutorials, however I only found a couple of videos which showed only the basics. What I decided to do was dive in head first and figure it out as I went along. The more I played around with Scenario VR, the more I learned, and I soon found out how to do most things. I used roughly 20 images and one video. On each scene I hid the tripod using the Yorkshire Ambulance Service logo and I linked all the scenes together using hotspots. I tried to use all the functionality in Scenario VR including adding questions and videos and having hotspots dotted around with relevant safety and local information. I then published this as a SCORM package and added it to our LMS. I was now ready to test the local induction. I found that it ran fairly smoothly however would occasionally cut out. The embedded video worked well and the overall flow of the scenario seemed to work really well. I was pleased with how this turned out however I knew there were some improvements to be made. After creating the local induction and learning the basics on how to use Scenario VR, I decided I wanted to change a few things. The first was the home page. I wanted to get a really nice image that would make the user go wow, rather than just being a boring blank screen. So I decided to go about near my hometown in Barnsley and get some nice 360 images. Then there were the icons in Scenario VR. I personally didn't like them and wanted something more appealing to the eye and something that would make more sense to the user. So I decided to go on Photoshop and create some icons then add them to the newly created homepage for the users to see. So I made nine new icons. These were return to home, play video, stop video, safety information, open door, enter simulation, teleport, exit simulation and information. Then there was a tripod. Previously, I kept the tripod and covered it with an image. What I decided to do now was to Photoshop the tripod out as I thought this would look more professional. So now I was ready to create the ambulance simulation. I went out and got all the images I needed, both inside and outside of the ambulance. I was now ready to test the ambulance simulation. Welcome to Yorkshire Ambulance Service Immersive Training. If you look left, you will see the different icons that you will come across during your training. To see what an icon does, select the icon. Once you are ready to enter the simulation, click on the spinning Enter Simulation icon. This icon will close down the simulation. This icon will return you back to the Yorkshire Ambulance Service Immersive Training homepage. We now had our ambulance simulation ready to go. There was one last thing I wanted to do though and that was to test it in a headset. So here we have an Oculus Go VR headset. What I've done is I've put our ambulance simulation on our LMS 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to access this via the headset. So let's give it a go. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for that, Richard. And that was also a really nice object lesson in how to make an informative video. Richard will be joining us for questions in about 20 minutes time. And I'd also like to point out, or just remind you, that we have a really nice video on e-learning support services provided in Yorkshire from Kyle, Michelle and Brenda. And that's available on our um, Tell Friday page. Apologies, guys, we didn't have time to fit you into the, the packed schedule today, but I do recommend you guys watch that if you are interested in uh, providing support service for e-learning in your trust. What we're going to do next is go back to Jo and see how she's getting on with the virtual reality training to overcome her spider phobia. Okay, I thought I'd do a quick update because I've been on this level for some time now. There's a few challenges that I need to overcome before I leave this level. Uh, one of them is that I have to take my eyes off the spider and everyone knows spiders are magicians. They disappear if you take your eyes off them. So I'm having a little difficulty doing that. Uh, the other thing I need to stop doing is reacting when the spider gets close to the edge of the virtual table. I tend to move away from my physical table when the spider gets close to the edge of the virtual table. It makes no difference to the virtual environment. It's just a, a body reaction that I need to stop and, uh, and calm myself down on that. So a few challenges yet to go. The other strange thing that's happening is I've been watching this beast crawl around this table for so long now that I don't need the headset. I can close my eyes and see it. I'm really excited to share with you that I didn't move away from my table when the spider got close to the edge of the virtual table. That's a first. So I was really excited and wanted to share that with you. And another thing I'm excited about that I, is positive, I took my eyes off the spider. Yep, I did that for one whole second. I was really brave. I'm so so pleased with myself so my next goal is 10 seconds so on a positive note this time i'm going back in okay a quick update i've tried the huge spider level now for three days um and not really getting on very well with it at all I really don't like it coming to my side of the table. I, I push him away again and I'd stop that on the other level. Um, I've taken the headset off a few times, but I am persisting. So there is a positive side to it. Okay, time's run out on me. Tomorrow's Friday and it's my designated day to visit Tara at the zoo. Uh, my body is definitely telling me I shouldn't be going. Yesterday I woke up with vertigo. Today it's not so bad, but I've got a throbbing headache. So goodness knows what I'm going to be waking up with tomorrow. The next time I update you will be in the studio um, and let you know how the visit went. So what do you think? Was Joe or will Joe be able to have a tarantula on her hand or not? Stay with us to find out. There'll be some more, two more clips as we go through the show. And I'll be talking to Joe later about this experience. So if you have any questions you'd like us to feed to Joe when she's live in the studio talking about what it was like,
do please send them in. And any other comments and any other questions, we'll have Richard, we'll have Paul later, and uh, Mark uh, from the software show, which you're going to see in a couple of minutes. Please send all those questions in and we'll be answering them live in the studio. We now go back to Learning Technologies, that conference in London in February this year, and we'll see some more tips from big names. We've got uh, Will Thalheimer, we've got Kathy Moore and Tricia Ull giving their take on the current field of e-learning. The first piece of advice is um, figure out why you're evaluating. We don't evaluate just to evaluate, we do it for a reason. We ought to do it to help us make our most important decisions. And when we know what those are, then we can make sure that we're designing our evaluations to help us ask those questions. So what kind of data can we get that give us insights into that, that diagnose the real sort of benefits that this learning is creating? And we need to be able to work backward from those benefits to what's causing those things. Um, what structural design methods are working, what aren't working, and what if we added this versus this? So again, it starts with the right focus, the right questions, working backwards. What's the biggest mistake in evaluation? Well, first of all, I'm going to give you more than one answer. There's not evaluating at all, giving up on it. There's uh, evaluating the wrong things, uh, focused only on, well, the default thing we do is we ask our learners questions about their satisfaction and the reputation of the course. And we know from the science, and there's over 150 studies that show this, that that does not uh, correlate with learning results. So that's the, the, our default operation is to ask our learners, but by doing that only um, and doing it poorly, we're getting false information that gives us sort of some superstitions about what we should be doing versus some real valid data about what we should be doing. One piece of advice that I can give L&D professionals at the NHS when it comes to artificial intelligence and learning and that piece of advice is we have a tendency of paying a lot of attention in L&D about artificial intelligence in the cognitive domain, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the effective domain because this really has a lot to do with a lot of the interventions that you're probably working on, like around patient care or about being able to support medical staff like nurses and doctors, people that are offering compassionate care that really are more attentive to things like um, compassion and empathy and are playing along more on soft skills, if you will. So when you look at artificial intelligence and look at specific L&D package solutions that are driven by artificial intelligence, make sure that you also pay attention to not only ones that help deconstruct our technical skills, but also the ones that help to deconstruct our core or foundational or soft skills as well. So make sure to pay attention to the effective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, uh, artificial intelligence tools as well. The concept of agile development is to allow flexibility during the development process. So rather than building something and at the end of the process you're testing it, actually what you're doing is you're testing it as you go through the process. And I think for me it's the engagement of the SMEs in that process. The SMEs don't always know how to develop learning. They're the subject matter experts, and it's us taking them on that journey, but allowing them to see it as a rather than it being at the end because that's costly, it's rework, etc. For working with SMEs, if they come to you saying, We need a course on X, my tips would be as I mentioned in the talk, I like the question why a lot. Why do we need a course on X? What's been happening with X? Is this a new thing that we need to make sure that everybody does differently? And that leads to another tip, to get the subject matter expert to focus on what do people need to do? Because they might be over-focused on the information that needs to be installed in their heads. We need to help make sure that people can see how that changes what they do on the job. So we may need to, tip number three, help the subject matter expert break down different job roles. What is it that people are going to do differently as a result of this? When yeah. somebody asks for a course, I recommend focusing, helping them focus on the performance problem rather than the content they want to deliver. Because 
they might want to be delivering content that actually does not serve much of a purpose or again people need to be able to see quickly how this will change what they do on the job and so if we help focus on the problem the problem might be an increase in infection rates in a certain situation okay that explains why we need <laughs> to help people change what they're doing and here's what they need to do differently so the subject matter expert being an expert in the information is focused on delivering the information. We need to help pull them into the real world, into the room where this thing is happening and, and have them describe what do people need to do differently to solve this problem. Hi, welcome back. I'm live in the studio with Mark Palmer from Taunton. Hi, Mark. Hi, Amanda. Um, Mark has got some really interesting software to tell us about. There's four things. The first one's uh, to do with the classroom, and then the other three are around video. So, and the first one, Mark's got a really unusual name, hasn't it? What it is has. it? It's called Plickers. Oh, how interesting. And who is that for? So it's for trainers or teachers in the classroom. It's a formative assessment tool um, that doesn't rely on technology, apart from for the trainer. So students are just given cards to use to allow the trainer to assess them. And is, does that cost? Is there a cost involved? I'd buy that for a dollar, but uh, you can actually use it for free for up oh. to five questions per set. Or if you want to do more than that, you can pay about seven pounds a month. Brilliant. OK, I think we've actually got some VT, so we should be able to have a look at this now. So should we have a look and see what it looks like? So it's, like I said, on-spot evaluation. It doesn't rely on pens, paper or the students' uh, trainers having any sort of technology on them themselves. And you print out what are essentially QR codes. And around the sides, they've got A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. So students hold them up, rotate them for whichever answer they think is correct, and then you scan the room with an app on your iPad, tablet, whatever you might have, and it automatically gives you feedback on the board behind you in graph form or just data form, depending on how you want to, to show it to the group. Fantastic. That looks really good. So um, if we can have a look at one of those, that yeah. would be really great. So uh, so this is your sort of QR code equivalent. It is. And it's got so letters here, A, B, C, D. So you'd hand those out to the participants on the day yeah. and then present a question on screen behind them, would you? Exactly. Yeah? So you can assign each of these cards. So you can have up to 63. Yeah. Each of these cards you can assign to an individual name, so you've got the per person's name coming up on the screen, yeah. or if you don't know who the participants are before they start the, the session, yeah. you can just assign them a number. Okay. Um, and then as you rotate, it gives you the different answers. You scan the room with an app, like I said, on your smartphone, tablet, yeah. and it automatically brings up on the screen for you red and green uh, lights to show who's got it right, who's got it wrong, who's yeah. agreed, who hasn't, and then feeds back to the screen to give you the Fantastic. overall results. So and you can export that as... Um, data if you need to use it for later. Brilliant. So you get that instant feedback and that interaction in the classroom, yeah. which is which is really useful as a trainer, isn't it? Definitely. It just breaks up mm. the talking and the discussions to have some mm. sort of interactive quiz element in yeah. the session. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So if anybody's used this one and they want to tell us about it, then please do mention it in the comments or text in. Or if you've got any questions about this, please do text in. So next up, we've got a video app, haven't we? Is that we right? have, yes. Yeah. It's a slightly so higher end. Have a look at this on screen. It's a slightly higher end video app called Filmic Pro. Um, it's fourteen ninety nine, which is quite a lot. Mm, for that's an app. pricey. Yeah. But what it does is it takes the existing camera functions of your iPhone, Android phone, and just enhances them. It gives you more features that you would find in a actual video camera or SLR camera. So you've got control over f-stop, ISO, more control over the exposure, the focus. And as you can see on the screen, you can move the focus ring, the exposure ring around and pinpoint the exact bits of the image you're filming mm -hmm. to enhance it. And who uses this? Um... So it has been used in Hollywood. Steven Soderbergh filmed a, a movie on it last year called Unsane. Wow, um, oh, okay. So obviously, if you're filming a, a motion picture, you've got to think about then downloading all of the footage quite yeah, regularly because yeah. obviously there's storage on an iPhone. The capacity wouldn't be great unless, I guess, you had a newer model. Exactly. So older phones might not be able to support this app. Mm -hmm. And clearly, the, the newer the phone, yeah. the better the experience yeah. will be and the more options will be available to you. But mm -hmm. it just allows the user to have more options to hand. Mm. Um, and so as you can good. see on the screen now, you've got the focus ring and the exposure ring. So it just gives a much easier control of those settings rather than relying on the pinch 
yeah. and grab thing that we're all so used to on our phones. Yeah. And you've seen our footage on screen of some of the examples used. That's incredible. Uh, created it's using this app. Really good, doesn't it? Really good. It really is. Um, and mm. like I said, it's just very intuitive. And yeah. I think all, all phones have got pretty good cameras on them now, but just have that extra level of control mm. really enhances the experience mm. and gives you a much better Mm. Um, output at the end. So would you recommend using uh, this app and your phone rather than perhaps using you know, a main big camera that we might possibly use? I think so, it's more portable. Mm. So if you were using this in conjunction with, um, you can buy lenses or lens kits right. for your phones, yeah. so you can get widescreen, um, anamorphic, macro. Anamorphic? So What's anamorphic? A, a, <laughs> almost super widescreen really. Oh, you okay. can do it in yeah. post, but if you've got the little lens on your, your phone, yeah. It's, it's done. Yeah. But if you're using it with um, a gimbal or a stabiliser, uh -huh. you do have all the kit with you. You can carry it around, put it in your bag, phone in your pocket, and you're ready to go. Yeah, and you get great results by the look of it. If they're using it in Hollywood, it sounds like an amazing bit of Yeah, I think technology. more and more people are trying to use it yeah. in Hollywood. So. Yeah, fantastic. And you've got a, a cheaper version, haven't you, for us, for us now? Yes, so yeah. there's a, a cheaper so alternative, look at that. which is a Pro Movie Recorder. So you can use this for free if you're happy to have a watermark on your video, which of course not many mm. people are, mm. but it is considerably cheaper at two ninety nine. And again, you do get control over exposure, uh, frame rate, etc., but just not as much control. Mm. So it's great if you're entry level, you want to start making more. It's a good for beginners. So perhaps maybe using this one first to yeah. give it a go, see exactly. how that goes, and then perhaps uh, graduate on to Filmmake Pro. Yeah, I think so. Mm. But it is a great little app. Um, mm. And again, you, you do have the settings you can change, but you are more limited than you are with Film Pro. But at two ninety nine, it's worth experimenting with to see if it does what you need it to do. Yeah, that looks like a bit of a bargain to me, actually. It two ninety nine, fantastic. And you've also got some editing software for us as well, haven't you? Yeah. So this is a, a little more high end, but this that. is Adobe Premiere Rush. So if you have um, Creative Cloud or the Adobe Creative Suite, you do get mm -hmm. this included in the price. If you haven't and you want to download it, it works out about £8 a month. If you're really serious about video editing, then I would recommend Premiere Rush because you're getting a lot of the ability of Adobe Premiere on your smartphone, on your tablet. Yeah. Brilliant. That looks really exciting as well. So I suppose you can do that on the go, can't you? Which is one of the benefits of that. So yes. normally I would be on my computer in the office doing my editing, but actually I could take that with me and do that on the train even. Yeah, you can. Mm. And... I mean, it's showing on screen now the ability to rotate video to put picture in picture, which I think is really useful. So you, you can layer the video like you can on your desktop version. Yeah. But with everyone wanting to do things on the go, upload to social media. So if you were running a social media campaign and you wanted to edit something, put it on online, yeah. you can do it a lot quicker. You can film, straight use away. Filmic Pro, Pro Movie Recorder, edit it on your phone, upload it to social media straight away. And you don't have to worry about getting home, downloading the footage, then uploading again. It's all just done really quickly. Fantastic. That sounds really great. Thank you very much. So if you've got any questions for Mark about any of those pieces of software, then please do text in or put comments on YouTube. We are now going to go over to a video from Nick Perez, who's going to tell us what's been happening in the VR lab here at Torbay Hospital. Hi folks, Nick Perez here down at Torbay Hospital. Just want to take a few minutes now to talk about virtual reality, believe it or not, and actually progress with our VR lab, which has just hit its kind of one year anniversary of um, a VR lab being set up here in the Trust. And it's been a really exciting journey. We've even written a report about it where we're kind of detailing some of the user cases of using VR and actually what the VR lab has afforded the Trust. So we've seen the lab um, going from kind of a fledgling idea to a space that's used very, very frequently, two or three times a week by various groups, our staff, clinicians, patients and the public. Everything from patient intervention for distraction or anxiety reduction to internal content creation to some of the more human factors and non-technical skills work as well, critical communication, patient perspective. There's a whole host of use cases which we've kind of detailed in, the in this report. And so I just wanted to offer a couple of minutes now going over some of those. So the VR lab at Torbay and South Devon NHS Trust, which is this hospital, is one of the first purpose-built VR labs within an NHS. And we built it really to investigate the potential of immersive VR technology as a technology-enhanced learning tool. We want the VR lab to provide both a physical space and actually be flexible in the way that we take equipment up into the clinical spaces or into our classrooms. 
The rapid advancement in immersive technology and software are opening up loads of unique avenues of healthcare interventions. The changes in technology also mean that access to immersive virtual reality environments is becoming relatively affordable compared to where we were even five years ago. So it's definitely an area which is generating more and more interest. One of the projects we've just recently created is Stop Before You Block, which is a project which actually is to aid patient safety in our anaesthetic environments. Very simply by using 360 degree video, we're able to use this as a training tool to show actually the process of stopping before you make a block. One of the projects you may have seen some news on last year was using a programme called Virtual Wembury and Professor Bob Stone and his team from Birmingham University, an intervention we used in our ICU. Now this very simply gives a wonderful visual interface for peddling and rehab around a nice environment. Wembury is a place by the seaside down here in Devon. Rather than looking at magnolia walls, the patient can cycle around the coastline and see their progress. Some VR experiences are actually very easy to access, and some of them are free. Virtual anatomy software called ShareCare VR is an accessible entry-level experience that's proven very insightful for our early stage medical students who require a 3D visual interpretation of anatomy beyond textbooks. So VR for distraction therapy, well we've been using VR for distraction with our podiatry team who have been doing nail surgery weekly with patients. It's been a fantastic resource with some excellent feedback to the point where a, a number of our patients were able to use VR for distraction effectively enough that they were able to overcome their fears and their anxieties. And how about gamification? We all like a video game, but what about if that video game had an ability to help teach something really important like critical communication? Well, we've been using a video game, a VR video game, called Keep Talking, Nobody Explodes, which is as fun as it sounds. The person in the VR headset has to defuse a bomb, but the only way they can do that is to speak to people outside the headset who have the manual for that bomb. So they communicate to defuse that bomb in five minutes flat. Now, what if you keep swapping those roles around? Now we start talking about critical communication with multidisciplinary teams, very effective, and in the debrief we can start talking about how do we talk to each other more effectively. So those are just a few examples of our use cases of VR here in the Trust. If you want to find out more information, the report should hopefully be released quite soon. Otherwise, my email is following now. Feel free to get in touch. If I can help you out, please let me know. Thanks ever so much for listening. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Nick. Nick Perez here from our very own uh, West Country Horizon Center showing just what's happening in virtual reality. And clearly, we're going to see a lot more of this. What we're moving on to next is Leodel, who um, a lot of you will know make resuscitation equipment. They have a resuscitation quality improvement uh, kind of set, really, now, in which learners are able to refresh their skills and thereby prevent skill fade in basic life support uh, on a regular basis. And a lot of you will know I've been pushing evidence-based education techniques for like 30 years, and quite often I'm just a lone voice. And when I went to the demonstration, which you're going to see on video uh, shortly, the rep started off by saying we use evidence-based teaching methods. I just thought, is this real life or is this fantasy? And I was just so chuffed to see it. And so we're going to see now a video of this set in operation. Staff will log on to your learning management system, which will be the page displayed on the computers with their own individual log on. They then do the psychomotor skill that they've been emailed about. Um, so the system will email you and say, you've got this learning to do uh, this, in this 90 day period. It then via some IT magic links them into your system, pulls out of our cloud the learning um, course that they've got to do, whether it's compressions, ventilations, compressions and ventilations, adult, paediatric or AED. So it covers all of those for the actual doing. Uh, they then do this course, uh, so they watch a short video, which is about 30 seconds to a minute long as a reminder and refresh about what you need to do for this activity. They then um, can read through a description of it as, as well if they don't want to listen to the, the video. We would always obviously recommend that they listen to the video. They then do their psychomotor skill and as soon as they start the psychomotor skill, uh, for the first compression or the first ventilation that's not done to the guideline depth, um, release, speed um, and, and the ventilation volumes, then the computer will automatically start coaching you and to, to get you up to that standard, to improve that quality. So the first course will be a baseline, so it'll take you, this is us at day one, uh, or the first course on the system, and it'll give us a blind assessment. Then the next courses will come in, you'll do the psychomotor, you'll get coached, 
um, and as well as her coaching you um, throughout doing the learning skill, she's assessing you at the same time. So at the end of take compressions, for instance, there's 60 chest compressions. So you do 60 chest compressions, you get coached to improve your skill, and at the end of those 60 compressions, she says, right, stop. So you um, press the stop button, or she stops you, um, and then um, it will assign you a score, it will give you all the feedback. It will give you each an individual compression that you've done to the right depth, the wrong depth, whatever it is. It will give you tips to improve. It will give you the ventilation volumes, uh, when, you, when you shocked, how long it took you to shock, and all of that within the time frame. They'll have either a mobile station uh, or a cart-based system or a simulation cart, um, and they'll be based throughout the different clinical areas or the areas that your staff will work. So they will come and find it, whether you move it round and rotate it, like one of our sites does, um, or you leave it in a static place where staff know that they can go and find it, um, and then they go and find it, log on, disappear again. Um, we say it takes 10 minutes to log in, so from logging in to logging out, um, and that's having three attempts to pass. If you pass first time doing compressions only, you'll be done in under two minutes. So we have cognitive, which can be accessed from any computer or um, smartphone, tablet, um, and then you, so you're doing a remind and refresh through cognitive, where the com computer does what you need it to do. Once I've finished them, um, if I've got above the required standard, which is 75% as a pass mark, the results fire off into the cloud. So I think that is a really fascinating example of evidence-based teaching or evidence-based learning techniques, in fact, in practice. And I think we're going to see more of that because it uses tried and tested methods of retention and also spaced learning by doing resuscitation training every three months. And I reckon over the years to come, we, you, are going to see a lot more of this sort of self-supported training taking place that makes best use of space learning techniques and retrieval. It's not cheap, but it's evidence-based and it's not just telling people stuff and it's not death by PowerPoint. So we're going to see more of that. And going back to m not using death by PowerPoint, let's go to Amanda now and see how our e-learning and face-to-face -face challenge is getting on. I'm back with the e-learning challenge team. So Andy, how have things been going? I think they've been going really, really well. Um, yeah, they, they, they've gone through the course a few times and they've been practicing pretty confidently. Obviously, they haven't been able to interfere, just been observing. But no, it's, it, looks, it looks like it's going all right. Brilliant, it looks really good. Do you mind if I ask you a question there? You look a bit tied up. <laughs> how did you find the e-learning? I found it really well. It's, the videos worked really, really well. I was able to go back and watch them again and again and again and look at the points that I may have missed first time round. Um, and it'd be something I could go back to. So if I did forget how to do it, I could do it again and again and again. I don't have to bother a trainer. I could mm. do it at 9am in the morning or 9pm at night. It wouldn't matter. Brilliant, okay. And how confident do you feel? Because it looks like you're going to be doing the sling, <laughs> the challenge. Are you feeling ready? Because we're going to be having a test in a minute. Let's just say that the Will team are going down like the Titanic. Oh, got some fighting talk going on here. Fighting talk. I think we ought to go and see how they're getting on next door, see if they're doing as well as you. Okay, let's head on through. Hi, guys. Hi Hello, we're back. Oh, fantastic. How's it going, Will? How have the guys been getting on? Yeah, it's going really well, actually. Um, they're doing good work. I'm impressed with them. I think mainly that's down to the superb teaching they received. Um, but yeah, they're doing really well, which is a contrast to Nextdoor, where I find, as with a lot of e-learning, they've found it a little bit dry. Uh, 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 sorry, 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 I have to interrupt there. I don't know what you're talking about there. Well, I've heard, I've not heard any positive things come from this room and I think you'll find that those guys are doing well. And also with what they've done today, we could be training the entire NHS in theory. There we go. Um, so there's a fair <laughs> few points raised by me there, but um, I guess the proof is in the pudding and when we do the actual assessment with our paramedic, we'll see who's done the best. Okay, so should we find out what your guys think? Okay, so how have you been getting on with your practicing? We've done a little bit of practicing. I think we're doing all right. Um, we had a good teacher. Um, Nick demonstrated, uh, Will demonstrated. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we've, I think we've done all right. And do you feel confident when it comes to the test? Because that's the next thing that's coming up a little bit later. We're going to nail it. Excellent, good, fighting talk from you. How are you feeling there? How did you find the training and the practicing? I thought it was fine, it was good. Good, yeah, excellent. It was good. He knew what he was doing, yeah. so yeah. 
Oh, good stuff. Okay, so who's going to win? Who do you think? Let us know. You can text in and tell us which team you think is going to win the challenge, or you can put a comment in the YouTube comments. So do that now. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you to everyone who has already commented. We really appreciate your comments and your questions. So now we are back over to Nick in the studio. Thanks, Amanda. Next, we're going to look at the results of an e-learning research project we carried out at the end of 2018. We had 30 healthcare professionals all involved who, in uh, the training field, many of them new to it. And we divided them up into three groups in order to try out two new ways of assessing e-learning. A lot of us are very familiar with the standard way of uh, doing e-learning assessments using multiple choice questions. What we did, uh, everyone in the study used the same learning materials, which you can see on your screen now, but they were assessed in different ways. So one group, and you'll see coming up now on the screen next, were assessed at the end of the learning using multiple choice questionnaires. We've all seen that. It's given at the end of an e-learning module. The criticism is that it's a bit easy and can be just, you're just recognizing phrases you saw literally a few minutes ago. Another one of the groups was assessed immediately after each module by having to enter missing words. And you can see that on this screen. And now you can see like the green section there has a little drop down where you can choose words. And there are also blanks that you fill in words. Interestingly, they offer the first two letters, which is a research based uh, way of um, starting off this method. The next group, the third group, they didn't have fill in the blanks. They just had to give their own answer using free text. And the system actually recognized whether they used those keywords in it. And if you look at the next screen, which shows you a score where I've just done a dummy run here and I just got 63%, I wasn't allowed to continue and it asked me to go back and have another go. So these two groups, both the fill in the gaps and the free text, had to get this 100% before they could go on to the next module. So this was actually quite hard and forced you to pass it. So I'm going to ask you now to consider who got the best retention when we sprung a surprise test on the participants two weeks later. Was it the traditional e-learning? Was it the fill in the missing words? Or was it the people who just did the free text? While you think about that, I'm just going to show you a short video of two of the participants explaining what they got out of participating in the experiment. Uh, I found the experience of um, undertaking the e-learning was really, really uh, valuable and beneficial. In fact, it was so valuable that I recommended it to some of my um, colleagues. It was different. I think knowing it was part of an experimental type process probably had me a little bit more focused. But I thought it was really good and also how the bits that you hadn't quite got right or hadn't quite remembered, you'd then go and recap again. It really sort of committed it all into your memory. It was good, a good way. There was vast differences in this module where because it had a level of reinforcements whereas the previous e-learning um, generally on the shorter version pro projects I've done have not had the um, repetitiveness so therefore then the reinforced learning has not been there. A lot of the content was new to me um, and that was really good actually so having really the experience to be guided into looking at the right, um, the right sort of areas was really really valuable. So you would read a slide you would take the messages from that slide and then you'd be given key words to help reinforce that message but you would have to recognize what those key words were in order to type those back into the appropriate place in text. The part that I really took on board and, and use all the time is about how people um, learn by sort of imagining a story to themselves. And now ask people to read text off screens rather than me sort of talking, reading it for them. I know that helps them learn a bit better. Is understanding when we're looking at how we teach somebody or how we train somebody to use a certain skill or a device, for in my case, we make sure we revisit that and actually get them to press the buttons rather than just show. So it's that engagement of that learner engagement, so they do as opposed to you do and they watch. Um, and I also like some of the new content. It's nice having some things that are familiar so it doesn't feel too overwhelming alongside some of the new things um, which we can transfer into practice. So no, overall I found it really benefited me, um, was really helpful and as I say I've sort of recommended it to a couple of colleagues so it must be good. <laughs> so as you can see they actually got quite a bit from the learning. Quite apart from what they were able to remember some of them changed their practice and this inspired us 
to create a bigger course which is now being built, which will go onto the Open University's FutureLearn platform and be available uh, to anyone in the National Health Service later this year. So the results of the study showed that the fill in the missing words and the free text did remember slightly more. But those of you who would know about statistics know we have to apply an analysis to this and take into account what is effectively a small number. And once we applied an analysis of variance, um, we found there was no significant difference that we could claim, sadly, between the traditional e-learning, the missing words, and the free text. There's a sobering finding that I haven't mentioned yet, which was the two week later test. Bear in mind, all these people were interested in training and the material was designed for them. Two weeks later, they had all forgotten at least 75% of the material that they'd scored 100% on two weeks earlier. And there's something for us to seriously look at as a health service here in terms of e-learning that we assess and we assume people know it, but what actually happens one week later, two weeks later, three weeks later? We're going to be doing some more work on this. But for now, thanks very much to everyone who took part in that study. And please do look out for the MOOC, Train the Healthcare Trainer, which will be available later this year. Now we're going to go to look at an augmented reality app, which has been nicely demonstrated for us by Phil Redford. Hi, I'm Phil from Dorset Healthcare, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to showcase how we're using the Zappa application to deliver augmented reality experiences to our staff across the trust. So why augmented reality and not virtual reality? Well, virtual reality has its place. However, most staff don't have access to the headsets required to receive that virtual reality experience. Most staff have a phone, and we have free Wi-Fi in the NHS, and we have free apps. So let's go down the augmented route. Augmented reality for us is delivered through the Zapper application. This is a free app available from both app stores. First thing we need to do is download the Zapper application from the App Store. Once downloaded, we then need an augmented reality poster. Here's one I created earlier. So this has a Zap code on it and it's unique and contains various hidden bits of content that can come to life when scanned. So let's open the Zapper application. As you can see, it starts to scan for the actual document and looks for a Zap code. So this is now found a piece of information. On this occasion, it's a video. This video can be stopped, can be enlarged, and can also be downloaded to the device so you can watch it later, i.e. providing bite-sized bits of learning. To view it again, it is actually on that poster. So the poster can move and the content will move with it. We've also developed some zap codes that have 360 video tours of some of our sites embedded within them. These are for patients and staff to use to visit our sites. By following the arrows, we can simply walk around a unit and have a look what's inside. On the walls there may be videos to watch. And the 360s are fully interactive, meaning you can walk around. Here's another video. My name's Jacob Beale. Uh, I'm the manager of The Retreat, which is where we are. Here's a patient poster that promotes the benefits of vaping compared to smoking. The actual software used is called Zapworks and this is a way of easily creating new Zap codes. So there's one here for the towel group I created. So with this I can see how many times people have looked at it so it's got some analytics about it. If we have a look at the actual Zap code itself 
there's a video on the page uh, the zap codes down here and if I click on the actual image uh, I've set it to play on start when people zap it it allows saving to the device and it pauses any other media so it's really really easy there are actions for each um, item you put on so I can link out to other websites I can set up emails so if we have a look at this one if I capture the code and look at the content as you can see it's playing the tell Friday video which I can pause uh, download the device I've also got an email set up on this one which straight away gives information so hi Phil I'm interested in understanding how augmented reality can be deployed within our service this will come straight to me which is brilliant so there we go that was Zapper hope you found it useful and you can see how the augmented reality can really provide a bite-sized learning opportunity if you want any more information please feel free to contact me and I hope you really enjoy the rest of Tell Friday okay thank you very much for that Phil really nicely put together a bit of videotape there what we're going to do next is go to a book review and the book that's being reviewed this year is about training misconceptions and Siobhan Lindsay of Musgrove Park Hospital has looked at the book for us over to you Siobhan Hi, I'm Siobhan Lindsay. I'm Outreach Librarian based at Musgrove Hospital. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about Clark N. Quinn's latest book. Um, he's an educational th theorist and he has written it especially to inform organisational learning. What he does is called Millennials, Goldfish and Other Training Misconceptions. He debunks all of the myths. Um, he pulls apart um, neuralistic, um, linguistic programming, Bloom's taxonomy, generational learning, um, gender, all kinds of things like that. He um, presents studies that suggest um, arguments for or against each of these uh, approaches to learning. And he also looks at in terms of technology and how we can enhance learning that way, different um, theories around that, for example, digital lit um, natives, people who are born using technology, um, we really need to not assume that they have naturally got those skills, that they've got the comprehension needed when learning digitally, and that they have that digital literacy. In terms of the evolutionary aspect of digital learning um, is important. Um, Clark Quinn um, puts forward that we do not um, presume that our brain is developing, is evolving at the same rate as digital technology. Um, it's an important thing to bear in mind. What I really, really like about this book, however, is um, the quick guides at the back. It's really nicely organised. It sets out um, the arguments for and against. It's got the studies, the research behind. It's got the citations, which is a librarian we like. And it also has um, recommendations for um, learning outcomes. I think what really makes us aware of is, especially within our trust, when we have a lot of staff who are upskilling or maybe returning to learning for the first time in a long time, going into new roles, such as assistant practitioner roles, um, that we need to be aware that technology um, and digital um, approaches to things are currently being rolled out um, a quite a pace and we need to ensure that we support our staff with the training around that to enable them to actively participate and to feel confident in what they're going to achieve not only in their learning but in their roles going forward and um, we need to be conscious that when we're planning our training sessions to include an element of technology to enhance that learning um, as much as other active learning um, elements and flip classroom approaches and things like that. It gets you thinking around those assumed um, theories and myths that we've learnt around learning. Um, it's quick, easy read, to the point, and if you do get around to learning it, I hope reading it, I hope you enjoy it. It's um, available widely through most health libraries, I'd imagine, and most trusts, and um, widely available online and on high street stores. So, We've got questions. We've got questions now for Mark and Paul Wilder. Unfortunately, because the live link crashed while we were filming this, we're unable to uh, involve Richard Grice. But if you've got any questions, please email them in or text them in after this, and we will uh, ask Richard to respond to them on our uh, Tell Friday page. So the first question we have is for you, Mark. And 
This is uh, a question about, to do the great things that you've shown us, how high-end does your phone need to be? Well, for an iPhone, you need to have iOS 11 or higher. For Android, it needs to be um, at least within the last two years. So there are particular phones it works on better, but as long as it's within the last two years, a model that's been bought, you will be fine, it will work. So that would be what, iPhone what, 7 or higher? Or? iPhone 6S will run it. 6S. Yeah, as long okay. as it will run iOS operating system 11, it's, you're fine. It's that operating system yeah. that's a crucial thing. Okay, that's great. Another question uh, for you, Mark. Can you create presets on Film Pro? You can. So if there are particular settings that you've um, changed that you really like, you can then save that as a preset into the, into the software to use that next time you're using the app. So yes, okay. you can. Yeah, great. Okay. Now, um, we've got a question, and this is for Archie, although I'm guessing you'll <laughs> want to answer the, answer the question, uh, Paul. Is Somebody said they'd heard he can do capillary refill. Oh yes, of course, because mo most mannequins, certainly all the ones back at my hospital, you cannot do capillary refill on them. Yeah. But you can do a virtual capillary so refill. So we need, we need a close-up? Oh yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's on Archie's leg. So Archie just... So effectively, uh, and I'm not a clinician here, so you've got, to, you've got to bear that in mind. So I hold it down, and it go, you see it's going bright you're there. You're not going to hurt me again, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> and then I release it, and I count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and now it's, kind of, now it's dimmed down. So I think... I think from what I know from my simulation, it's over two seconds, it's, he's got his circulation a little bit compromised. Yeah. So you might need to go and see a GP or something, I think, there, uh, Archie Harrison. Okay, okay, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Okay, so we've got another question here. Um, now, I think, this, I think this is for you, Mark, because I'm not quite sure, is, or is it for Paul? What is the, oh no, it's for Paul. What is the picture quality and latency on the wireless devices? Oh, the ones that we're showing for the digital signage. Well, the, the older one the is, is 1080p, so that's still yeah. pretty good. Yeah. The, the new twice as big, twice as much expensive version, this one is actually 4K ultra high def. Okay. So this is yeah. really good. Yeah, brilliant. You know, so, um, in terms of latency, I'll have to put that on the Facebook page afterwards, but it's not very much. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Thank so they're quite good devices. Okay, we've got a question there about Archie. Oh. Um, can you put him on a ventilator? That's a good question. Archie, can you go on a ventilator? Yes, I'm ventilator compliant, and I can change my lung compliant and even breathe CO2. And you've still got a voice issue, though. You yeah. really don't need to see someone about your voice box there, I think, Archie. Thank Excellent. you very much. Excellent. We've got another question. Somebody's asking, how much is Archie? So... Archie is just a tad under £40,000, which in terms of high-definition mannequins is kind of at the, at the kind of top end, but is, is not like, you know, is very, is very reasonable considering the extra functionality, I feel. And when, yeah, when you're looking at, if you actually take into context, or take into account mm -hmm. rather, the learning that the medics who use, and the specialist nurses and so on who use Archie, you're getting quite a lot. Of, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, my point of view, I, 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 the, the thing that I always go back to that I really like is, is the fact that most of the other mannequins um, just lie there inert and you can't, yeah. you know, and there's a real, I think there's a real problem, the clinicians say to me, there's a real problem with um, that in real life you could tell when your patient deteriorates, you know, because, it, but with mannequins you just can't tell that. But at least you can tell with Archie um, that, um, that, you know, he's, he's moving. Yeah. So I think that's really good. Yeah. I think it's certainly a way forward. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and this, uh, I, th I think this next question related to the simulants. Is it live or fake equipment? Was it live? Or oh, fake? so the, the one I saw outside, yes. the live one, so the, yeah. the Southwestern Ambulance Trust, because they're using Gomart Mannequin, um, their equipment is all live because you can use live equipment on right. this. But the other simulances, which are using different mannequins, they're not using live equipment, they're using, they're using training equipment. Okay, I understand, gotcha. Okay, and I've got a question here, and I'm not sure who will answer this. It's about Oculus Go. What app? was Joe using for the um, spider phobia? Who can answer this? Joe? <laughs> Fearless. Fearless. Oh, and the, okay, the, so the name of the app that Joe was using, and we, uh, which we saw, and as you saw on the final videotape, um, actually really did work, yeah, was called Fearless. And we'll put a link to that on the page. Any more questions? <laughs> Has Nick dried off after being in the sea? Well, I guess it looks like it. And uh, I'm going to be eating this for supper. 
I think that's all the questions now. Okay, thanks very much, Paul and Mark and Archie. That was really helpful. And as I mentioned earlier, please send in any questions for um, Richard and we'll answer them on our web page. We now go to the bit we've all been waiting for. Was Jo able to have a tarantula on her hand? So let's see whether she did. I'm on my way to the zoo. I've just got a few more steps to go. Um, I'm feeling really nervous. My hands are very wet. My tummy's full of butterflies. I've got dizzy spells. I don't know. Yeah, I'm feeling really good at the moment. <laughs> Yeah. This is your education Yeah, this is education Is this where you have schools? Yeah, school groups come in here. Um, obviously, they wander around the zoo as well, for classrooms and things that are all in here. Okay. Are you happy to wait in there till Robin turns up? She's right over in the far corner. Right. So, you can come yeah, stay I'm happy here. to wait here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, perfect timing, you can go on. Hi, Lauren. 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 Hi, Tara is your is hers. friend. Well, I brought Chiquita in as well, just oh, in well. case one didn't fancy it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've had Tara. How long did they live? Years. Up to 20 years. What, what did you want to be doing at the end of it? Just being able to be close to her and not to her? To I think, is the ultimate goal. If that's, she's okay with that. Well, yeah. With people who are not so sure that to do that side of your hand because it's mm. not as sensitive, so as this is more sensitive, and what we could always do is just get her to walk over your hand. Oh, do you know what I mean? Okay. So then she's on you and then off you. Yeah. Okay, I've, I've been working up to this moment. I have really been yeah. working. Yeah, this is where we find out if technology yeah. works. I guess. See. So this is Chiquita. This is the older one. And then this is Tara. Wow, they're not as big as I thought. You thought they'd be much bigger. Yeah. Any preference? Know. Which lady? No, <laughs> uh, no, I don't. So I've already put like in there, in here is like stuff from their house. They don't like new stuff. Yeah. And everything's slow. Like I like to do everything on their terms. No, there's no rush, yeah. Because there's nothing, you know, in handling in it for them. It's only, I mean, people handling them. Is for oh, it's okay. Sorry. But they taste through their feet as well. So every time she touches me, she's like, "Oh, do I really want to go on there? Because that doesn't taste like my home, or definitely isn't yeah. something that I would go on normally." Just put your hand on the table and let her. Yeah, you could always do like what I'm doing and just let her taste your your hands. Because for I mean, they explore everything through mm. scents, through like salt, salt, through taste. taste. <laughs> <laughs> it's Salt's better than perfume. For them. <laughs> You can just put your hand on my hand if you want. And then I can control your hand. And then if you want it to move, then I'll just tell it to go. You can feel her feet, it's like oh, really tiny. That is so soft. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she, she likes you more than me. What? <laughs> Tara. And you can like, I basically steer spiders with, she would like you, wouldn't she? She's beautiful. Is it she? Yeah. She is beautiful. Better than any, the spiders I've seen in that virtual reality app, they just don't what? move like that. Well, I never thought I'd do that, but <laughs> actually that was, wasn't bad mm. at all. She's got so delicate feet. Oh, they look mm. like they mm. are mm. so delicate. Do you want to actually, another? Actually, being here with her is mm. better than the app, actually. But yeah. Been here I don't know. I guess we'll never know. You never know. know. <laughs> you never know. And she's pretty much all on you there. But she you can see she feels safest, doesn't yeah. she, with her leg on, on there? On her, on her thing. little hmm. log. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. <laughs> so I knew it would be you, and I doubted you this morning. I thought, <laughs> when's oh, your back? <laughs> thank you very much. That's really kind of you no, both. Pleasure. And thank you, Tara. Wow, Joe, that was really fantastic. So you actually held her on your hand? Yeah, her whole body didn't go on, but her legs came onto my hand, okay. yeah. They were yeah. very, very soft. Um, little pads are underneath her feet, just like a cat's paw. 
Um, and they, they feel like cotton buds being pressed against your fingers. Okay. Yeah. Very gentle. Yeah. yeah, she was. Yeah. And so did you, well, how did you feel leading, leading up to that day? Oh, leading up to that day was hor horrendous. It started two days before the, the actual date to go and visit Tara that I had all sorts of health problems. I was dizzy, I had headaches, I had tummy troubles. Um, so yeah, it was really quite horrendous, the body side. Um, but yeah, I, I did it and that I'm really pleased with. I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because obviously it worked. The program that you took worked, the, the virtual reality fearless it program. It certainly helped, yeah. Uh, and yet you weren't aware of it until the actual moment came. You know, it's, it's really strange. You sit and, and watch a spider. So the first section is just this small spider crawling over half of the table. It doesn't come near you. Yeah. Um, and then the second level, when you've got used to that, is that little spider comes on the, your side of the table. Um, and then you get used to that. And when you feel that you're used to it, that you don't push away um, or make any other reactions to the spider, you go on to the next level, yes. which is yeah. a, a bigger spider. Yeah. Um, and you kind of re start all over again because suddenly your body starts reacting again to that bigger spider. So you start all over again. And then on that level, I had to take my eyes off the spider for 10 seconds before I moved on to the right. next level. And that was really hard. Um, and then when you get to the next level, it was a whopping great monster <laughs> of a spider. Um, and yeah, you have to get used to that. And then there was levels and levels, yeah. yeah. It was just sitting and watching a spider, which doesn't sound like you're, I wasn't doing anything except sitting and watching a spider and trying not to react to it. Yeah, and you did actually invest quite a bit of time in this, didn't you? Yeah, it was two months um, I started before the actual date of visiting Tara. I knew I was going to visit her at the end of May, so I started um, back at the end of March, beginning of April. Um, and I was, roughly, um, I was roughly doing half an hour in the evenings, and then the month leading up to so the beginning of, of May, end of April, I started doing it 15 minutes in the morning as well as okay. a good half yeah. hour at the, in the evenings. Sometimes I had to take the headset off, take a break, and then go back in. Yeah, because I remember one of those shots, I could see you actually, in the early shots, you actually oh, yeah. walking back away from... Yeah, they, they, they don't, it, the spider, when it came on the screen, started always in the top left-hand corner, so you knew where to look for it to start with. Um, but that one there just came straight from the left-hand corner towards me, and right. it, was, it was big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they were quite monstrous. Compared to Tara, she was beautiful. Yeah. So when you actually did that i think you mentioned something earlier about you just re you just kind of almost like reframed what she was yeah she the, the first spider they tried to get out of the, the the box um was an elderly spider i think she was 14 years old so she was graying a bit and she didn't want to come out she really didn't want to come out um so the the laura, laura lauren the um specialist there and the spider keeper she got the younger spider out, Tara, and when she brought her out, she was black, um, hairy, um, but she was really beautiful. And as soon as I said, she's beautiful, this sort of calmness just came over me, and I just knew then that my hand would go and I'd allow her Excellent. to stand on it. <laughs> Excellent. That was, it's been a really fascinating experience watching you going through and thanks very much for doing that for this program. That was yeah. a big ask. And <laughs> well done you for staying you. with it. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so we're back to the learning challenge now. Let's see how they're all getting on. Over to you, Amanda. Wow, I'll have some of what she's having. We're back with the learning challenge team. And uh, Joan and Fiona from Bath think that the face-to-face -face team's going to win. So what do you think of that? I think, thank you very much, Fiona and Joe jo from Bath. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, how do you feel? They're not behind you. Well, what can you say? I mean, I think they've uh, backed the losing horse over there. Okay, well, time will tell. So we are now going to have the test. Um, I have a number of questions here. Each question is worth one point. And I'm going to ask the teams the questions. And they are going to hold up a card, which looks like this, which either says arm or what have you got on the other side? Elevated, to tell me the response to the question. So teams, are you ready? We yeah? Ready. You were born ready. Fantastic. Okay, so the first question then. A child has fallen out of a tree and sprained their wrist. Both ready? Yeah, well done, correct. That's one point each. Well then, Andy, keep the scores for me, please. Mm -hmm. Next question. 
A patient has arrived from playing rugby. They have a swollen hand injury, which is also bleeding. Yeah, well done. They're both correct. So you're on two, two each. Ooh. A patient has fallen from their push bike and has a suspected fractured rib. Brilliant, full house, three each. Oh, this is going to be close. So that's our theory element over with. And we now need to do the practical element. And I have got Shane here with me today. Hello, Shane. Hi, everybody. Where are you from, Shane? I'm from Southwestern Ambulance Service, um, one of their training officers. Brilliant. And you're going to be judging our slings for us today, aren't you? Yep, that's right. Brilliant. Okay. So, guys, if you'd like to start making your slings so that Wayne can watch... Have a look, see how you get on. How are they feeling? Are they feeling comfortable? Yeah, very comfortable at the moment. Yeah. Is yours feeling comfy? Very. Oh, okay. Looking good so far. Will, how do you think your team's doing? Very well, I'm impressed. Yeah. They're looking like what you've trained them? Yes, I think so. Looks good. Yeah. Andy, is it looking like the e learning pictures? Yeah, it's looking really good. I think Kerry's doing a fantastic job there. She's just tidying up at the end. Looks supported right to the tip. Yeah, we're looking good. Okay. So, you're done. So, first to finish. And Pip, are you finished as well? Brilliant. Oh, ooh, it's neck and neck, neck and neck. Right, so Shane, what do we think? Do you want to go over and inspect yeah. the two things? Thank you. Okay, so we've got a good tight knot on the side there. It looks as though this sling is well supported. We can see the patient's fingers, which is important. Um, and just having a little look. Yep, so it's nicely uh, knotted off in the corner here as well. So uh, in terms of scores, I'm going to give that one a 9 out of 10. Very well done. Brilliant. Nice okay. work. That's a great score. Okay. So <laughs> on to this one then. So let's have a little look. Um, so we've got a nice tight knot at the back there. Um, you can see the patient's fingers, which is important again. Patient's arm looks well supported, and yet we've got a knot just at the side there. I'm going to give that one an 8 out of 10, just because there's a slight slant on there, but they're both very good slings, and they would both work effectively in terms of supporting the patient's arms. So, brilliant, well brilliant. Done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane, for doing that for us. Thank you very much. So, we have the scores then. So, who's our winner? Andy, how many did you get? Well, I think we might have got uh, 8 plus 3 will be 11. And Will, how many did you get? We got nine plus three, so we've got... Twelve! <laughs> <laughs> Twelve! Twelve, you're the winners! Yeah. Okay, guys, so that was a really interesting experience and an experiment. And I understand that there was a winner, but it wasn't like a massive difference. Is that true? I think that's fair to say. Yeah, we were um, neck and neck. But uh, yeah, uh, e-learning, um, sorry, classroom did get one more point. Okay. What, what do you think about that then, Will? Yeah, well, so it was a really interesting experiment. I did think at the end it was too close to call, but there was a slight inclination on the e-learning team's sling, which meant they dropped one point. Um, but in terms of how they put the slings on, in terms of the engagement with the, the patient, that was all really good and pretty much spot on. So there was a slight difference, but not really significant. Okay. And I mean, it's interesting to think because people sometimes say, oh, it's got to be e-learning or it's got to be classroom. But essentially, we did the same thing via e-learning and via classroom. And both worked, really, didn't they? I think it's safe to say, yeah, that both were um, feasible means to deliver this content. Um, yeah. We use this sling. Obviously, we're concentrating solely on the sling. But if we broaden this out, it's about picking the appropriate delivery method yeah. for the appropriate messages. And we've shown that either can be used for tying a sling um, but yeah, for, from our, our perspective as uh, learning technologists, we need to pick the appropriate method. Uh, yeah, and I think that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because the kind of, they both used the same learning method in as much as they did similar things, but it was a different delivery method, wasn't it? So Will was delivering it face to face and you'd pre-prepared it and was delivering it via e-learning. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we worked, we worked to the same, uh, all our objectives, we shared them mm -hmm. uh, beforehand. Um, we used, it was either video or face to face to the delivery of, but yeah, the actual... Yeah. 
that when you break it down, they were very similar. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I think also looking at Andy's e-learning because it was such a well-made product. There were the videos in there. He got the practical test for people to actually have a go at it, which is often lacking in some e-learning. It had a really big impact for them. If it had just been a simple read and click through multi-choice assessment at the end, I would put money on that they wouldn't have been able to do mm. that thing as well because they actually practiced, put it into practice, had a go at it. They managed to do it pretty well. I think that's a really good point. Would you like to comment on that, Andy, this thing about not, not all e-learning is well, really e-learning? Yeah, I'm, I'm on my uh, personal crusade to re, you know, for, for the opinion of NHS e-learning specifically to be, to, to be looked at. Because I know lots of people have a bad experience whilst doing their e-learning, which yeah. is a, a page-clicking experience with a quiz at the end. Yeah. But e-learning doesn't have to be just that. You know, mm. It can be engaging, it can be practical, it can make mm. you think which is critical, make decisions, make practical decisions yeah. about the, the role that you do, rather than just this uh, endless information with a quiz at the end. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So not all e-learning is the same, you know, um, and I, I don't like the fact that it all gets branded and therefore people's opinions, rightly so, if they've had a bad experience, yes. are um, that, it, that it isn't effective, that it, you know, it, the classroom is always better. Yeah. It's about blending the two together, getting the strengths from both, is what yeah. I suggest. You know, like a classroom session could have digital elements that were, that were pre, 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 yes. pre elements that yeah. so you, you, you clued up before the classroom even starts. So it's our role, it's our job to pick the best elements of both to create training solutions using the best elements of all of them. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for that, guys. And I guess we're both going to be thinking, or you're both going to be thinking now about uh, next year's challenge. Mm. Yeah. It's going to be bigger and better. Bigger and better. <laughs> I'm keen, now we've got our northern friends are engaged. Hopefully we can maybe get a uh, north-south challenge. Maybe. That'll be good. Yeah, well, That'll be really good. So Bigger. You guys, anybody watching this from up north or the Midlands or London, well, Channel Islands, anywhere at all. Join us for next year's challenge. Fantastic work. Well done, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to judge the challenge today. So we all need to head back into the studio now. So if you'd like to all scoot on through fast, mind the cable. <laughs> yeah, you can keep the sling on if you want to. Go on through. We're going to head back to join Nick. You'll get to see a little bit more behind the scenes now. So, Joe. Ushering us through the studio, we've got Jack here, who's our technical expert, and Laura, who's our sound engineer. Hello, hello, we're back. <laughs> so this is a great big thank you to everybody who helped make Tell Friday reality. Many apologies, everybody, for the technical hitch we had partway through, but what a fantastic bunch of people, because nobody panicked, well, at least not very much. So thanks very much to the guys of the e-learning team, Thanks very much to Archie here, to the people who were doing the e-learning, or taking the e-learning and actually quite enjoyed getting tied up, I suspect. And, <laughs> and the trainers and everybody who put that together, to Joe, our production manager here, to Jack, who's like perspired about two pints out there, and Joanna, who's been taking the comments coming in. And a particular thank you to those of you who came in and told us the uh, cultural references we're going to see you next year and we're going to have like 10 laptops to make sure nothing goes wrong next year. <laughs> the main comment is, I'll be back.